How do great stories begin? Ridley Scott's Blade Runner starts with a detective seeking his identity. Satoshi Kon's Perfect Blue begins with the struggles of mental health for a Japanese celebrity, and Tarantino's Django is a former slave in search for his companion. The one thing that all these movies have in common is from the start they have clearly defined their narrative. Another movie that incorporates this is DreamWorks' The Prince of Egypt, which does an excellent job of setting up its narrative, defining its conflicts, and making their characters seem interesting. So, this is The Prince of Egypt, a story of two brothers. The film begins with an opening shot establishing the grand scale of the Egyptian empire. The song Deliver Us, composed by Hans Zimmer, begins to erupt from the Hebrew slaves as they cry out for their god. The camera then pans through Egyptian structures, showing us even more Hebrews in a dire state of need. The film then cuts to a Hebrew baby being protected from mass genocide. This baby will become known as Moses, who will be the main protagonist throughout the film and eventually deliver pun intended, the Hebrews to their salvation. Moses escapes his death through the adoption of the Queen of Egypt, and the film cuts to black. In this opening, we are clearly given a message. The Hebrews are calling out to their God to save them, and Moses is their key to that saving. So after the first opening sequence, we cut to a horse race many years later. This quote unquote second opening not only sets up the bond between Moses and Ramesses, but also contradicts the entire first opening set of scenes. The horse race serves as a lens for how the Egyptians see their kingdom rather than the Hebrews, which is shown by the stunning visuals backed with uplifting music. Moses is relaxed, an uncaring character, voiced by Val Kilmer, who gives Moses this deep, crisp voice that also has the flexibility to show a more softer side. Ralph Fiennes, the voice actor for Ramesses, also has the same characteristics of Moses. However, at this point in time, Ramesses has the burden of becoming the next pharaoh. We see this burden Ramesses must carry with a beautiful wide shot of the entire kingdom. This is what us film nerds call an establishing shot. This shot establishes the kingdom of Egypt as well as the future Ramesses must uphold. Seti, voiced by Patrick Stewart, is the current pharaoh and father of Ramesses. In this story, he is the character that will trigger Ramesses' fate in this narration, telling him, one damaged temple does not destroy centuries of tradition, but one weak link can break the chain of a mighty dynasty. Ramesses has now begun the journey as the antagonist of the story, the next pharaoh. So let's pause real quick. In storytelling, there are these plot devices called man versus. You can have man versus self, which is a conflict happening in the character's mind, or an internal struggle. Man versus fate is a person who struggles with his fate or destiny. And finally, man versus man are quite literally two characters conflicting with each other. In this film, Ramesses must maintain his future empire in total control of the Hebrews, creating a man versus fate and foreshadowing his conflict with Moses. Another thing I find fascinating as we progress through this film is the statue where Moses and Ramesses talk. This play serves as a mechanism that strips them of their plot devices and fate, where they can just talk like brothers. We know this because of the characters relaxed tones and light banter exchanges, emphasizing that this is a place of escapism for them. Just a nice little detail that may or may not become important later. Who knows? Get around everyone! I'm gonna teach you about religion! Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. The first call to action comes to Moses through his encounter with Miriam and Aaron. Moses cannot accept the fact that his entire life is a lie and that he is an illegitimate son. So in ignorance, he rejects Miriam's call to save the Hebrews, which causes him to run from his past. And the movie shows this by changing the perspective once Moses realizes his true origin of being a Hebrew. The music makes the atmosphere feel 
dense and the animation becomes suffocating. Slaves start surrounding Moses everywhere he goes. However, still with ignorance, Moses is rejecting this call to action and the song All I've Ever Wanted begins to play. This song serves to be Moses' coping mechanism with this new knowledge that he is a Hebrew. All his life, he has been raised as an Egyptian, taught their ways and lived as royalty. So being told that he is a Hebrew is nonsensical to him. But Moses is our protagonist, the destined savior of the Hebrews, and a person with a good moral compass. And so Moses' views about Egyptians are challenged with this imaginative dream sequence of hieroglyphics. This is where Moses becomes aware that he would have been slaughtered if it wasn't for his mother. Upon awakening and finding out that this was actually true, Moses learns the true horror of the Egyptian people. His stepfather Seti also holds this ideology, an ideology that claims the only way for the Egyptian dynasty to thrive is through an authoritarian slave empire. I don't know about you, but so far this movie is... Mm -hmm. This is a very good movie. This huge dump of knowledge causes Moses to leave everything he once knew, including his brother Ramesses, who has now already taken the mantle as Pharaoh. Moses is left wandering the desert, stripping himself of his Egyptian clothes, his titles, and everything he thought was a lie, except his brother's ring. This is such a nice detail by the writers because even though most of Moses' life was a lie, the love he shared with his brother was real. And with a sandstorm engulfing Moses, we can finally end the first act of the movie. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out! Now with Moses self-exiled from his previous life, he must now learn the ways of his people, the Hebrews. This part of the story serves to educate Moses, to help him learn. Throughout this movie, we haven't seen a lot of and then. It's been a lot of this caused this types of storytelling, which is fantastic. But what do I mean by this? The movie doesn't use the and then principle. For example, the Hebrews need a savior. Therefore, they pray to their god. Thus, Moses is created to be their savior. Or the Pharaoh Seti is dying. Therefore, there must be another ruler. Thus, Ramesses must hold that mantle, which opposes Moses' fate, to become the savior of the Hebrews, which directly opposes the Egyptians because they need the Hebrews. Thus and therefore is the same thing as cause and effect. When you have a causality in your story, it makes every action feel justified when moving the plot. It gives a reason why plot A caused plot B, and in all fairness, it is a great way to form a skeleton of your story. So about 40 minutes into this movie, Moses meets Jethro, father to Zipporah and a religious priest for the Hebrew God. In the song Through Heaven's Eyes, sung by Jethro, he says to Moses, If a man lose everything he owns, has he truly lost his worth. So how do you measure the worth of a man in wealth or strength or size? These are just great teachings in general, but they help tell Moses that people shouldn't value objects more than others, and that all kinds of people should be welcomed into society. This god accepts you for your own individual self, which contradicts the previous song all I've Ever Wanted, where Moses quotes all the wondrous statues and buildings built on the backs of slaves. The cause of Moses' change of heart and mind was the effect or influence of Jethro. It leads him to a montage showing the new ways Moses is leading, tending to sheep, marrying Zipporah, and overall living a fulfilling life that is not based on status or gold. This is what people call in an action film a training arc or side story where the protagonist learns from the teacher. Moses needed to go through all these things so that we can feel that the future actions Moses will take are justified that when he comes to save the Hebrews in Egypt, he will know their ways, and in return, they can accept him as their savior.
The burning bush sequence in this movie is a very interesting and mystical experience. Moses enters a cave and inside there is a bush that seems to be on fire. Blue color tones fill the room and an eerie sense of ambience fills the area. This scene could be interpreted as Moses facing the fact that he needs to return to what he has left, that he is the only one that can save the Hebrew people now his people. The burning bush scene is the second call to action. Moses has gone through his acknowledgement phase of the Hebrew culture and now must return to his brother Ramesses. Upon returning to the kingdom of Egypt, what do you think would happen to Moses? Would Ramesses hate him for leaving? Would he send down the God's wrath upon Moses? <laughs> Moses! <where have laughs> Ramesses! This is arguably one of the best moments in the film. We probably thought that Ramesses would be furious with Moses, but instead, upon further realizing it, it makes sense. Why would the two of them be mad at each other? Throughout the entire film so far, there has not been a single ounce of pure anger or rage with Ramesses towards Moses, and vice versa. Ramesses was heartbroken that his only brother left him, so it would only be natural for him to be ecstatic upon seeing him again. But because because of Moses' reasoning for his return, we now get to see the conflicting viewpoints. Moses begins to tell Ramesses that the Egyptians have done wrong. They have enslaved Hebrews and in doing so will bring upon the wrath of their god, unless Ramesses lets them go. In response to this, Ramesses ignores this claim and instead shows Moses his gods. This is where we see a difference in depiction between the Hebrew and Egyptian religion. The Egyptian gods, Ra, Anubis, Sobek, Mut, and so on, rely on statues for magical spas to woo their audience. But as we've seen previously, the Hebrew god only cares for your good nature soul, the core essence of what makes you, you. And this compares comparison makes the Egyptian gods feel like more of circus tricks that are only in it for the profit to benefit themselves rather than you, at least in this sense. However, the Hebrew God requires just pure faith. That's the key difference I think this film is trying to make. A religion requiring trust versus one that envelops itself with greed, as seen with, again, the ginormous dynasty of Egypt. So when Ramesses finally believes in Moses, he becomes enraged. His fate or belief stem all the way back to the beginning of the movie and we are given a beautiful parallel between him and his father Seti, which is the same establishing shot we saw earlier, only with a much bigger statue of Ramesses himself overshadowing his father. In essence, these are two characters bound by fate to save their people from destruction. Ramesses has no longer made himself the quote unquote weak link. Moses explains to Ramesses that a kingdom built on the back of slaves is wrong. Ramesses refuses this notion because the only thing he has seen work is slave labor. The only reason Moses doesn't think this way is because he is a Hebrew and learned their ways. Both brothers have justified reasons for their claims, whether it be good or bad intentions. The only problem is, Ramesses cannot fathom the objective horror he and his people have committed which is his fatal flaw and will lead to his downfall. The plague serve as a great way to show the arrogance of Ramesses. Through this entire montage, we can see again, Ramesses is refusing to become the weak link, refusing to become what his father feared of. Moses throughout the plagues pleads with Ramesses to let his people go. From these events, the hubris of Ramesses becomes apparent. Moses is asking purely from his heart for his people to be freed, but Ramesses thinks that withstanding these plagues is beneficial, that not showing pain and being strong for the Egyptians is the only way he can fight. However, I think it's a delusion. Ramesses believes that he himself is a god of a very strong group of people, indicated by the multiple times of him saying, The morning and the evening star. I am the morning and the evening star. Ramesses, I am the morning and the evening star. So Ramesses thinks that his people have the will to survive and just decides to wait it out, instead of actually being a noble king and humbling himself and letting the Hebrews go for the sake of his people, but again he instead burdens them. 
thus creating the destruction of his empire, thus becoming the weak link. Ironic. So before the last plague hits, Moses finds Ramesses at the one place they could talk with each other. Again, this is a location I mentioned earlier in the video, and this is where they're stripped of their plot devices. This is where they could talk as brothers, which is a beautiful and nice detail. It shows us that these people probably never wanted these roles, but they were destined by the threads of fate to do so. And the movie just doesn't spit at your face with these types of plot points. <clears throat> You know, as the last plague hits upon the Egyptian people, Ramesses has lost everything now, including his only son. This shot of Ramesses carrying his son and Moses approaching him is nothing short of amazing. It's amazing because it feels empty. There's no sense of good or bad, no gods, no nothing. Only two colors fill the scene with Ramesses walking towards the light, with Moses shadowed in darkness. Moses has done something terrible, brought plagues on a specific group of people because they were harboring slaves, yes, but it was still murder. Both of these brothers have done terrible things for their people, and it makes the audience question how truly good Moses is, and how heavy the burden is these two have to shoulder. And honestly, now there's not a lot of this story left. I know it's filled with incredible visuals, but the story between Ramesses and Moses feels over, and that's because it is. The entire attack sequence led by Ramesses is void because he lost a long time ago. What does Ramesses gain by this? His people are in ruin. He lost his only son. There's just nothing. What I'm getting at here is there's no gain, except for the satisfaction of killing all the Hebrews, which of course ends terribly. Ramesses' story ends with him being stranded on a rock by himself because he could not accept the fact that he was a failure, and in the very end, he refused to be the pharaoh that was the weak link that saw the error in his ways. The final cry of Ramesses is of many feelings, but one can be best described as just total despair. I want to make at least my point about this film clear. I don't think this film is about the Hebrew God and why you should follow him. Yes, it's a story loosely adapted from the book of Exodus, but in essence, it is a story of two brothers whose ideologies began to differ from one another. How one brother sees the moral wrong of the Egyptian people and because of this has to face his brother who refuses to accept the fact that what he is doing is wrong. I think the Prince of Egypt is really good. It's a story that uses various techniques and the span of less than two hours. It actually makes me mad because DreamWorks hasn't made anything close to it, but hey, what can you do? Anyways, that's all I have. Like, follow, subscribe, maybe a kiss on the cheek, and I'll see you next time.